Give us just a minute here. Thank you all for joining us. I just set up the YouTube stream. So this session will be available directly after at youtube.com slash Vicon. We also have a full playlist of the other 16 webinars we've done since October. So those, some of them are panels like this. Some of them are integration webinars. We've got different applications some staff hosted sessions. So definitely check those out. Um, we are super proud to be a gold sponsor of GCMAS again this year. We can't wait to get back to in-person meetings, but are really glad that we can use this virtual platform to connect with you. Thank you so much for making the time. Thank you to our panelists. Um, I'll let Kim do some introductions in a second. This will be a similar format to our other recent webinars. So Dr. Kim Duffy, our Vicon Life Sciences product manager, will be leading our panelists in a discussion on technology and gate analysis. So that will be about 40 minutes. Our Q&A section is open on this platform and I'll also be checking YouTube. So you can submit throughout the discussion and we'll get to those at the end. Um, with that being said, our GC Mass breakout room, we're in Zoom room two, that'll be open right after this session. So if you wanna come over and chat with the team, feel free to join us. And I think I will go ahead and pass it over to Kim to get started. Thanks, Alicia. Uh, welcome everyone. It's great to see so many of you uh, joining us today. So as Alicia mentioned, uh, this week is GC Mass, which we're proudly sponsored. And uh, this is sort of a collaboration webinar that we are doing. So today we're going to be discussing how technology has influenced clinical gates and sports analysis, as well as some future predictions. I'm pleased to be joined by two experts in the field, Dr. Kirsten Tulson Francis and Dr. Danilo Catelli. So Dr. Kirsten Tulson Francis is the Division Director of Movement Science at Scottish Rite for Children and Assistant Professor of Healthcare Science, Prosthetics and Orthotics Program at UT Southwestern School of Health Professions. She holds a BSc and MS degrees in Biomedical Engineering and a PhD in Kinesiology Biomechanics. Over the last 20 years, Kirsten's research has primarily focused in lower extremity, pediatric orthopedics, sports medicine, and neurology. Welcome, Kirsten. Dr. Danilo Catelli is a postdoctoral fellow in the Human Movement Biomechanics Laboratory at the University of Ottawa, Canada. He received his PhD in biomechanics from the School of Human Kinetics at the University of Ottawa in 2018, and his master's in bioengineering from the University of Sao Paulo in 2010. Dan's research is focused on biomechanical outcomes of pre and early arthritic hits, hip arthroscopy and arthroscopy outcomes, musculoskeletal modeling and sports biomechanics. He has recently been working on two different projects, one that uses wearable technology to monitor physical activity, intensity and bone impact loading in children predisposed to develop femoral tabula, I probably said that wrong, impingement, and another that assesses gait kinematics in arthrotic hips to characterize axial mobility. So welcome both. Just to say before we get started, as Alicia mentioned, we're going to be, I'm going to be asking questions uh, to both Kirsten and Dan. So if you do have any questions you want to ask in the group, feel free to submit in the Q&A section and I'll either ask them during this session or at the end of the session. So to get started, Kirsten, you and the team at Scottish Rye Children's are presenting quite a few research papers today and uh, tomorrow at GCMAS. Would you like sh to share us what uh, some of those uh, research you are going to be presenting at GCMAS this week? Uh, sure. So we have a number of projects uh, this year. Um, and they kind of range over a, a wide variety of topics. Um, so uh, I'm gonna give you a few highlights. Uh, the first one, um, we kind of took a little bit of advantage and this doesn't actually involve motion capture, but you know, when life feeds you lemons, you take advantage, right? So we took advantage of a little bit, a thing you might've heard of it called COVID. Um, and uh, we, we, we recognized that we weren't gonna be able to do a little bit of research for a while. so. We passed out some stepwatch activity monitors to some uh, some kids while we were shut down, and uh, we did some research on that and wanted to see how their activity levels had changed. 
Um, and that was a small study that we did that I'll be presenting later today. Um, but the majority of what we are presenting is actually some research that we, we got to really do while we were shut down. That was one thing that we took advantage of, you know, while we were, we had a little bit of downtime, right? So we processed some data. Um, so we've got projects that are on sports medicine. Uh, so we have been doing a lot of work looking at um, the changes of um, task variation on, um, on the impact of kinematics. So um, I think that there's a lot of, uh, of research that's been done in sports medicine on, for example, drop vertical jumps. Um, and there's lots of people that have looked at drop vertical jumps in a lot of different patient populations. However, if you look into the literature, there's not a lot of description about how those drop vertical jumps are performed. So are they done at a, um, with a box put it at half, a, half, um, half the patient's height away from the force plates, uh, a third of the patient's height? Um, are they told to jump? Are they told to pop off the box? Are they told to just, um, to just uh, step off the box. So we looked at variations in how that task is performed and what impact that task variation had on kinematics, uh, the kinematic, uh, um, kinematics of particularly at the knee um, in, uh, uh, in the landing, the first landing of the drop vertical jump. So we have uh, that task variation on the drop vertical jump. We have another one looking at the step down tap uh, so these are our steps kind of, and these are um, projects that we're doing as part of a multi-center group um, with uh, pediatric research uh, in sports medicine with PRISM Society, uh, Motion Analysis uh, Research Interest Group, RIG. Um, it's a small group of us that are trying to standardize some of these practices in pediatric research in sports medicine. And uh, so this is a collaborative, collaborative group that we're doing um, so those are a couple of the projects that we're trying to standardize some of these practices so that we can start to do some multi, multi-center multi research to uh, maybe get a little bit more impactful research um, uh, um, uh, in terms of uh, pediatric uh, injury and in, in pediatric research and injury prevention and um, ECL outcomes, things like that. So little tidbits that maybe if you're part of uh, GCMS this uh, today and tomorrow, you can check those out. They all sound really interesting. Uh, so Dan, uh, what are the most interesting current trends in clinical gait analysis or sports biomechanics you feel right now? There's a good trend now in going uh, and using wearables um, and trying as, as Kristen mentioned uh, that she, she took a chance uh, as COVID uh, during COVID and uh, so, so did us uh, to collect data out in the field um, so that's uh, trying to move a little bit away from the lab and going outside and seeing how, how uh, the people move outside of the lab in, uh, in that condition. Uh, it's, just, it's, it's a challenging task to do because uh, uh, we need all the validation behind, right? So uh, how do we know that the data that we're collecting in the field, it's, it's really good data and it's comparable to the data that we collected, that we collect in the lab. Um, so the, the, the trending, I think, is, is trying to move a little bit away from the lab, but uh, still trying to collect good data and, and being reliable. How about you, Kirsten? Can you extend on from that? You know, I think that Dan's got a really good point. I think that the current trend is to somehow integrate what we do in the lab with what people do outside the lab. And I think that that has been a really important factor in the clinical realm that we've been working on for a while. But I think that that's really the focus of the future is how do what we measure inside the lab relate to what they're doing out there. And, um, and I think, you know, everybody has the ability to like download an app from their favorite, you know, Play Store or App Store. But I think as researchers, what's really important is we need to make sure that the information that's being gathered is got the best resolution and is, is research quality if we're gonna use it for outcomes, right? So, you know, there's nothing wrong with those apps as long as the data is interpreted in the right way, right? And there's in, that information has its, has its place, 
And that could be informative on a personal level. It could be informative, you know, for my own sake, I might like to know what, how many steps I take, but it's, it needs to be, um, it needs to be interpreted in a way that we understand what it's representing and what its error is. And it, in, in, as long as we understand that and we're not using it in the wrong way, right? And we're, um, so I think that that's where, where we need to go is as researchers, we need to know these are the tools that we need to use from the research standpoint. These are the tools we need to use from the clinical outcomes tool to standpoint. And these are the tools that can be used commercially for you know, people's everyday lives, right? Those are three very different realms, I think, and clearly differentiating those and making that well established is very important. Yeah, I agree. It, it's, it's interesting that you both talked about getting away from the lab and you, you're already starting to do that sort of research. Do you feel like that is where we're heading, that more monitoring out in the real world is where we need to go from a clinical analysis standpoint? Yeah, I feel like uh, data is, you know, everyone, almost most of all the people have a wearable now, either via watch or phone or, you know, um, even I am used people are having it, like personal I am used right now. Uh, so that is out there. The thing is like how, exactly how Kristen mentioned, how do we filter that, you know? So, uh, so from my watch, how many steps do I get when I'm sitting on my desk working? You know, so there, there's two errors there. You know, how we, we select, oh, this is a step, this is a quality step done. Uh, and uh, the filtering of, of this uh, information that is given to us is super important. Uh, there are enormous applications now uh, with people using uh, AI or machine learning just to, you know, trying to identify patterns, identify uh, tasks that you do during, during the day using a a predefined uh, wearable, but how how does that um, gives back to us? It's super interesting because like every time I'm raking uh, my leaves or shoveling snow, my watch thinks that I'm dancing, you know, or swimming. <laughs> so it's it's like oh, we don't we don't have that option to qualify in this in the software or the app. Um, but filtering that information is it's really really important. Uh, and I feel like, of course, like uh, more you are, if you're in the lab, you have that one, two hour sections to collect data and, and that's it. But trying to understand your patient, how, how they move, you know, in the, in the outside, in the field, uh, or especially kids when they're playing, when they're doing their regular activities, understanding how they move, that's, that's uh, what the clinicians want to see. Yeah, because I guess with that sort of monitoring, it's probably good for you as clinicians to understand what they're doing. So it helps from a prescription point of view, I guess, during rehabilitation. Say if you've got a child with an ACL or some sort of movement that ensuring A, are they doing what they say they're doing or B, are they doing more than they should be and things like that. So you get a better perception, like hopefully you get a better treatment outcome at the end of it if you've got more information to utilize. Yeah. I think to me that there's there's never going to be a time for me, though, at least not in my foreseeable future, though, where I see outside the lab completely replacing the lab. Because to me, what the lab does is it gives me the controlled environment where I can control everything and get an understanding of the biomechanics of specific things. So, you know, in the, in the gameplay, I can't control everything. So I, I, there's too many factors, there's too many unknowns, but in the lab setting, I can control certain things so that I can get at certain questions. I can look at specific factors and, and then I can take that and then can relate it out to what I can capture in the field. So I still think that there's a place for both and I'm, I, I'm not at the point yet, I'm not at the point yet, I don't see it in my future yet, where I'm going to say I'm abandoning the lab. Yeah. Don't worry to my staff that's watching. Um, <laughs> I'm not ready to say that yet. Uh, um, there's still a point where I'm, the lab is very important. Um, and to me, connecting the lab, and especially where I can challenge somebody in the lab and maybe take them a little bit more outside of their comfort zone in the lab, you know, not only say, okay, walk, okay, do this drop limit, vertical jump, but maybe challenge them a little bit outside of their comfort zone, but in a safe and controlled environment in the lab, and then say, okay, now go out and take it outside of the lab and do 
do it in your own environment, and then I can correlate it back. And, you know, one other thing, if I can maybe go out on a little bit of a tangent, is the other thing that I like to do is also bring in um, a little bit of like patient reported outcome mental mental health um, uh, measurements as well, especially when we're looking more, maybe not in the sport, some in the sports world too, but looking, especially for outcomes research um, and to see how someone's recovering from an injury, how their activity levels are, you know, I can see how someone's biomechanics are on the lab and then I can say, how is this relating to their activity level in the community? But I still need to know what their mental health is because depression, anxiety, and everything else ties into that too. So there's still a role for that as well. And I always wanna, I always wanna bring that as a point too, to make sure that you get and capture that as well. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. Uh, Cause we're talking about the lab, I'm gonna move on to our next question. And um, Kirsten, can you tell us the type of technology that you're using in your lab to capture data? So do you use motion capture? I use force plates, for example. Sure. So uh, we do. We have uh, we have a Vicon system, obviously. Uh, so we have so we have two labs. Um, we have uh, I have two camp. We have two campuses at our, our, our hospital. So I work at a pediatric uh, hospital, uh, pediatric orthopedic hospital. But we have two campuses. One focuses uh, specifically more in sports medicine. So we have a much larger lab there. Um, so we have uh, motion capture. We have. Uh, we have force plates um, and on one, in our sports lab, we do have um, a force plate pit where we can move our force plates around um, on a rail system, which is nice because we can move them if we need to. Um, we do have an IMU system that we can use as well um, in both campuses. Um, with, we also have EMG, but we also do collect uh, some strength data if we need to. We also have the capability to do oxygen consumption, um, uh, portable oxygen consumption if we need to. So. We try to get uh, a full uh, capture of everything if we can uh, kind of attitude, uh, but we do it as needed, obviously with each question. So, um, and then we do have some, you know, uh, we will send uh, accelerate, accelerometrous uh, wearable sensors home um, with patients for activity capturing, um, activity um, monitoring if, ne if necessary as well. How about you down at University of Ottawa? Sure, uh, yeah, so the, the head of the lab is uh, Professor Lamont Ping, who is actually uh, in the in attendance today. Uh, so thank you, Mary, for joining us. Um, so the lab is um, at the university. We have, uh, of course, a motion capture system from from Vike, and we actually have two one side by side uh, from from different purposes. Um, we have force plates, um, EMG system that usually we integrate together uh, when when we do data collections. We have uh, isometric uh, and isognetic machines, um, as well as the IMUs that we've been using a lot recently, especially for, for some of the, the research we're doing uh, in and outside the lab. Um, and when we collaborate, uh, some of the research we do, we also collaborate with the uh, department at the, at the hospital. So then we can get advantages of using some imaging uh, machines as well. So, uh, you know, MRI, CT scan, X-rays. Uh, so uh, this goes on um, when we do some, some of the research. That's great. And Dan, uh, are there any best practices that you would recommend to other labs that are trying to use uh, these technologies for clinical gait and sports? Yeah, sure. Uh, I think like to get this question, uh, Kristen and I, we could, we could stay here talking like a lot. Uh, we actually have a, a pilot that, that we did uh, a couple of years ago, uh, where there was like a um, Scottish Rite Hospital in Dallas, HSS, uh, Boston University, um, Washington U in San Luis and ourselves. We got along together trying to see how good we would collect the data if we had all the five sites training exact same protocol to do motion capture. Uh, so we flew into to Dallas, we trained all the people together, and we test the exact same uh, participants in Dallas with the ca same cameras and same staff processing data. Uh, and it's true that that was not, you know, the same for the same subject. Uh, we should have had a little bit of fluctuation in the data. 
So of course, the standardization of protocol, it's, it's a key, key point. Um, so we, we could see that, you know, a person that places a marker uh, on, on a participant can totally affect the data, the outcome of the data. So having training, a good training, you know, and then uh, trying to standardize your protocol as much as you can, that's gonna bring you, you know, like more closer to, to what, uh, what you, you wanna look at or compare data, right? How about you, Kirsten? Uh, you know, from my standpoint, um, uh, Scottish Rite is, uh, we are a CMLA accredited lab. And, you know, I know that the accreditation process is a very uh, daunting uh, undertaking. And, and while I'm certainly not recommending that every, every lab has to go through that process, um, you know, I honestly would recommend that labs at least look at the documentation that's required. Because like, like Danello said, having really strong written, and that's the key here, written documentation of your practices and your quality assurance is important. Um, you know, how to process your data. How often do you do um, quality checks of, you know, uh, that check what the delay between your force plates and your motion capture system are? How often do you check the delay between your EMG and your motion capture system? Um, how often do you check the consistency of marker placement within the staff of your lab? Um, those are the type, what is the training mechanism of your staff, especially if you're an academic institution that has high turnover of students? You know, who puts the markers on? How, how are they trained? What is the process of assuring that they know what they're doing? Um, that documentation needs to be written it needs to be followed, um, and I that was key for me. And you know that was my one of the main reasons why I wanted to go through the CMLA process. Um, and it was you know we found things when we went through that process that I was like wow I did not realize how how we we really needed to do this. <laughs> um, and it was a really great exercise for our for our lab uh, to go through and we we've made some really great practices by going through that process so I would say that's the that's the best thing I can recommend is to just put those standard operating procedures in place. Yeah, that's really good. And typically, how often do you go through those standard operation practices, like reviewing your system, making sure that's okay, making sure your floor plates are accurate? How often, how regular would you do that sort of process? So, uh, so our quality assurance program uh, is is very detailed, and it depends on which test it is. There are some things that we do, you know, some calibration procedures. Obviously, we do every day. Some before every test. Some of them we do once a month, some of them we do every six months. Just kind of depends on the test. Um, so most of them we do, I would say once every one to two months, um, we will do checks on the delays between systems uh, for synchronization. Um, we, we do uh, EMG checks uh, every, every one to two months. Um, uh, and then consistency among staff is a, an annual assessment that we do where we all put markers on the same person. We, we do repeatability with each, with each staff member. I mean, and we're talking, I mean, this is not a high turnover place. We're, we're talking full-time staff in a clinical lab. We're still checking that annually. Yeah. Um, so absolutely. Yeah, no, that's, I think that's one thing like even working for Bicom, we always recommend users doing like check your equipment, check your trainers, like, Ensure you're not introducing errors and your setup is, is correct every time you, you capture data and how important it is to ensure it's properly calibrated and synced and everything. So that's a really good point. So speaking of, we've talked about the benefits and recommendations of, of current technology to capture. What are still some of the limitations that you both are facing uh, when trying to capture your desired data? Sure. Um... So of course it's it's still very challenging to say. Uh, although I would consider motion capture we do in the lab like a good gold standard of how people are moving. Of course you have other technologies out there as dual fluoroscopy, for example, where you can make sure where exactly your bone is. The thing is that limits the space and even the tasks that you can collect in a lab. Um, so of course that movement artifact of of the markers it's one thing that we try to control. Uh, so in our participants, for example, we, uh, there's one study specifically where we place the markers on 
when the person, uh, the participant goes for a CT scan. Uh, so it's before surgery, the participant must do a CT scan. We go there and that, that pre-scan, we go and place the marker and make sure the marker is the exact spot that we want for the pelvis and the knees. Uh, and then from there, the participant goes with the marker to the lab and then we collect data there. Uh, so this is one thing that we try to control too. It's still like, it's not certain that the marker will, how the marker will move compared to the bone uh, when when we when they're doing their tasks uh, and for the for the IMU there's uh, there's some some challenges that that we face uh, there was one study that we started and uh, we wanted to actually collect kinematics of the the participants uh, during the day and then there's still the the drift correction that we we must control uh, when we're talking about hours of protocol that that becomes very very challenging. Uh, so while you collect like in a few minutes, you're fine. When you extend that period of time, then that becomes a bit a bit challenging. And, and also like to, to guarantee that the kinematics you're getting out, out of the, the iron use, it's another thing. Uh, mm -hmm. So what is the reliability with that compared to what you collect in the labs? So that's, that's why we try to co combine the tool in the lab and just to compare and see how it goes. Uh, procedures for um, for dynamic and, and static calibrations. So those those vary a lot. You know how you make sure that um, you know you're doing a good defined refined calibration to have a good data when you're actually collecting the data set. So these are some of the challenges uh, we're still we're still finding today to to solve. Um, and, uh, but we can see that, you know, like how, how things moved in the past, if we say five, 10 years, uh, there, there was a lot of advancements already. I remember when I started doing, doing my, my PhD, uh, labeling data, it was, it was just a nightmare, you know, it would, uh, and there were so many options and ways to do it that uh, if you get the exact same task and label yourself in, you know, today and tomorrow, they probably wouldn't give exact same kinematics at the end. Uh, and now you have, uh, you know, a bit more uh, advanced ways of, you know, doing your labeling and, and standardize those, those things that make, make things a bit easier. Yeah, uh, Kirsten, do you have anything to add there? I'm just chuckling because I'm thinking back what labeling used to look like when I was a student. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> with my with my one inch ping, ping pong ball markers and no, uh, you know, you know, there's been so much advancement in the mocap area. I, I agree. Like that's certainly not like where I, where my hiccups are at this point either. I, I mean. Um, I think I share a lot of the same thoughts as you with trying to still uh, understand how we're uh, really gathering the IMU data. I'm still trying. I'm still trying to wrap my head around it all and get it all, uh, take it all in, if you will, and and get through it all. Like you said, the the very long data captures with it, and yeah. um, and understanding um, really how we're defining everything, um, you know, I feel like uh, I've dealt with a complex patients of motion capture in the clinical world, the children with cerebral palsy who can't, you know, have complex deformity um, and to go over to the sports world where we're used to seeing papers where they've defined the standing position as zero, um, and which is very common with IMU sensors. And, you know, to go from those two worlds and I, I have a hard time flipping back and forth um, and going that, to that technology switch that um, that's a big change for me. So it's more for me, more of a maybe a, not necessarily a technology limitation as much as a change in assumptions. And, you know, if you want to call that a technology limitation, maybe, but it's just dealing with a new technology and dealing with a new set of assumptions and it's a change in, in mindset and uh, how we're applying that technology. So it, to me, it's, it's just, that's, that's the reality that I'm at at this point. So I'm making that jump. So we're still working through that in our lab. So. <laughs> yeah, that's, it's really interesting that you talk about mindset there, Kirsten, in terms of you have to go, I am use our different to optical. And as you both said, you can't approach them the same way, you know, in terms of orientation, placement, and how you define it. 
But what's quite interesting is, do you see that other researchers and other clinicians that are using eye news, do you feel that they are trying to look at it as typical motion capture? So like optical and using these same assumptions and that maybe there's a misconception there in terms of the technologies are the same, but not quite the same, if that makes sense. I've seen it presented that way. Like I've yeah. seen presentations where people have presented data in the same way that it's been presented as, as the gold standard of motion capture in 3D motion, optical motion capture. And they've tried to do the comparison and it's it, it hasn't gone well in that, in that particular presentation. I'm not saying that they're not, they can't be, I'm not saying they can't be related, but I've seen presentations that have gone awry. And, and when I see that, it makes me cringe because in the, to the wrong audience that it can be construed in a very negative way in, in either direction. Either they're presenting very erroneous data that um, is wrong and it can be misconstrued or to the flip side, uh, they see it as I am news are no good and we should never use them. So you have two very conflicting sides of it, right? Like someone who doesn't understand the data is getting er erroneous data to the side of, oh, I am news are no good, but we have to come together and find a way to use both of them because they both have very great value in what we want to do. You know, motion capture in the lab has a great place. I am using the field could be our future. We have to find the way to merge them together but we have to do it in the right way. And using the same, the same methods and the same assumptions are not necessarily the same way to do it. So that's, the, that's gonna be the trick is bringing them together. And there's people who have done it. We just need to do it in our clinical world now, right? Like, so, yeah. Do you see that going more clinical, like especially a wearables and everything, the art, we, we know that they're rising. Do you feel like, clinicians are now at the stage that they can start adopting this technology and using it more or do you feel like it's still going to be heavily optical driven for the foreseeable future well i feel i feel like it's uh, it's very usable i i, I couldn't say better than than kristen you know like you get different data uh you get a longer data of course like if you if you have a chance to have a uh biomechanics lab in a hospital uh or or associated with one just yeah, go for it because you know the data that you you you're getting. Yeah, it's uh, you know it's it's unique and it'll be way for now a bit more precise than than the the I'm use. However, when when you're out of the field, uh, the the I'm data that you get will give you again a way more data, way more descriptive. And, and there's some some ways of going around, right? So uh, mm -hmm. we've tested a little bit the the stat app. Uh, from the from the eye measure use uh, and so far they're working well you know like they, they give you like for, for the step the intensity of it that step estimates a little bit that the the bone stimulus uh, that's given for every single step that you, you do and because they're two uh, sensors one on each ankle you actually know that you know a step or a jump or something similar that is classified as a step uh, it's happening there so it's you know I think we're moving towards uh, you know, uh, getting a bit more consensus. And as Kristen said perfectly, like the data is different. Uh, the way you interpret the data is, is a bit different. So um, the, the way that the concepts of the data you're getting out there uh, could be very interesting for, for clinicians for sure. Yeah, no, that's really good point. Um, just to kind of go off before we go back into the future stuff, because I feel like we're going to have some really good conversation here, but we can't, I guess, um, not think about the elephant in the room like we're all virtual right now because of the pandemic and COVID and Kirsten you talked about and also Danilo that how the COVID was to a certain extent a benefit to be able to get some research out that you might not have been able to get as much of if the pandemic had happened but we talked before this call about uh, new techniques and things that they've you've had to adopt since then is it been any positives or things that you're going to continue as the pandemic subsides or are you hoping to kind of go back to the old way of capturing and take that forward? Uh, you know, uh, we did some major changes to, you know, how we turn the lab over between patients and those are all for the better, right? I mean, that, that's for sure. Um, you know, I think that for the most part, 
COVID, I think, has just opened our eyes to, you know, how we how we've done everything in our lab in terms of patient safety. I think for the most part, though, I'm pretty proud that we did a pretty darn good job. Um, I did a survey um, through GCMAS uh, early in the pandemic. We GCMAS we did a survey of labs all across the U.S. and across there were a bunch of labs across the U.S. and uh, a couple around the world um, about what our cleaning cleaning survey kind of, kind of cleaning techniques and protocols. And I was actually really a lot of people were saying they weren't going to make a lot of changes because most of the cleaning procedures were already in place. So for that standpoint, I was I was glad to see that. Um, you know, it took a, it takes a little bit more time. We were a little bit more thorough. We we got more markers. We got more of everything. Right. We just we just switch everything out and make sure everything sits out longer and stays cleaner. Um, but the biggest thing for us was um, we we were doing some team testing. Um, before the pandemic, where we were bringing in kids uh, in a team setting into the lab. Um, and we were doing them in stations where we would have six kids in the lab at once. Wow. Uh, actually, six to eight kids in the lab at once, where we'd have like two in the station over here doing strength and sprints, two over here doing Y balance testing and you know range of motion, and then two in the motion capture volume at once which was really cool, by the way, um, to do, having two kids markered up in the motion capture volume at one time, doing drop vertical jumps and everything. Um, but I'm, I'm happy to say we're about to get back to that. Um, the bottom line is, is these kids practice together, they train together, they're together all the time anyway. So we're gonna go back to it. Um, now we're gonna try to limit the kids in the lab in the other station. So instead of doing six to eight kids, we're probably gonna do them in groups of four. But we're gonna we're gonna carry on. These kids are already together 10, 10 hours a week training. So we're gonna keep going. But we've been on pause, so we're gonna start this summer. But yeah. But we've been open since September, so yeah, that I mean that's very different to a lot of places as we were talking before, how different yeah. we are depending on where we are. Uh, Dan, how about you in terms of University of Ottawa? Yeah, um, we did collect some data last year, but uh, again, all the cleaning uh, protocol that was put in place uh, limited us, us on the amount of uh, participants that we could collect data. So uh, we are actually, when we were open, because uh, we're, we're closed right now, we would have participants like one in the morning, one in the afternoon only. It should give us, you know, um, of course we don't have the same staff that Kristen has uh, at a hospital, but just to control us and give us time to, to put all the cleaning protocols in place. Uh, but one, one study that, that I mentioned before was uh, collecting um, inertial data in, in children. Uh, so before, just before COVID, we're you know, budgeting for the, for the grants, uh, how we would proceed with the protocol to collect the data in the field with children. Uh, in, in our minds, we had a, a setup like, okay, so we, we, we must need like a, a research assistant to the children's house in the morning. They, they will set it up, the, the, you know, the, the probes, the kids go for the day. And then the next day in the morning, we go and swap the probes, uh, you know, and stop, start data collections, you know, recharge. Uh, and that completely changed. And then we said, okay, like how confident we are of, about training parents, you know, so we create like a video protocol, like, okay, um, we're gonna teach parents how to put the, the probes on, you know? Uh, let's see what we can get out of there. Like, the, I mean, we can, we can bring children in the lab. So if this is the only thing we can do, let's, let's go for it, you know? Um, so instead of like going, needing a research assistant every single day to go and swap probes to collect that, you know, for a full week, for example, we had the, pa the parents trained to use um, to place the probes and, and do the data collections themselves. Uh, and that went surprisingly really well. We, we did have some challenges with some of the parents that were not so comfortable with technology, but others, uh, they were fully confident, uh, fully confident and then they, they, they did well, you know. The thing is uh, controlling the placement with photos every single day, uh, you know, being from the outside, it's, it's not a thing that you can, okay, make sure that, you know, same, 
same uh, researcher place the probes in every single chip, that won't be the case anymore. But that's something that we found that probably we'll be moving towards that way, you know, uh, improving the quality of the training uh, for the parents. Because I mean, it's, it's placing an IMU on the ankle. So uh, of course things could go wrong if you place uh, up, you know, uh, upside down or the other side of the ankle. But if you get an standardization and train it well, uh, track to control, um, probably that's, that's how we're moving for this study right now. So keeping that way. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Bill. Um, so we spoke a lot about IMUs and that rise, and I think like, we've covered that quite well. Uh, how about Marcus? We're seeing more, obviously, Biocon are partnering with Thayer Marcus. We, we are seeing that rise in people wanting to use Marcus, even from a clinical and uh, sports biomechanics perspective. How, how, what are your thoughts on Marcus uh, in terms of that evolution? Would you embrace it? Do you think it's not quite there at the minute? Or yeah, just love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I think, I think it's a very interesting uh, thing to see and especially the, the new partnership with uh, Thea uh, right now from Viacom. That's super interesting, especially to compose the two uh, and, and see how, how variable it is. I don't think it's quite there yet. Um, you know, years, uh, I feel like three, four years ago when you saw it on YouTube, you know, a 2D marker from any video that you put online and start seeing, you know, tracking up the knees and the, the shoulders, the head, it was quite impressive to see. And of course, like when you, when you think and research, oh, can we translate that to 3D? What do we can get out of that there? Um, when, when you see uh, a markless, a full markless working right now, uh, I'm not. I'm not an expert. We don't use that in the lab, uh, but I feel like th that's pretty trendy. I think that's uh, how we are moving towards. And uh, if we if we have a standardization again uh, for this type of protocol, that perhaps we will eliminate you know some researcher placing markers that we we also saw that it's not it's not perfect. You know, so if we can get like a software to do that, probably uh, that will help a lot. Still, the data when we see videos, uh, even promoting it, you can see you know there's a there's a little tweaks here and there uh, for pelvis, for knees. Um, it's not perfect yet, but uh, I think we're more moving towards that that direction for sure. Yeah. How about you, Kirsten? Do you feel like you'd embrace Marcus in your future? Uh, I think I'm with Dan on this. I think that you know I think it's interesting, and I think that. And I think it's got a little bit of work to go, but um, I'm not I'm not against it. I don't know enough about it. I we haven't we haven't used it at all in our lab yet. Um, but uh, you know, I'm always I like to keep an open mind. You know, uh, like we said, I think as long as we understand what the uh, accuracy and the resolution and um, understand all the assumptions that go into it, um, I'm always open for uh, for new technology that can make our our uh, data collection easier and uh, uh, make it easier for the kids. That's always uh, great. Anything that can make, it, make our jobs easier will be great. <laughs> yeah, so we're getting into the final two questions and I'm gonna open it up to the group. And the first one um, is, uh, what are your predictions for the future in the next 10 to five, uh, five to 10 years in terms of technology? Yeah, I feel like uh, once we have an inertial data, uh, thinking about like five, 10 years from now, once you have like inertial data, very reliable, markless, very reliable, uh, we're just increasing that amount of data we can collect, right? So when, once you have a good data to work with, uh, the, the, the amount of data we'll have will just increase exponentially. Uh, and, then, and then perhaps we'll see like a jump, you know, uh, we're already seeing a jump in AI and and machine learning, as I was saying, but like that's that's gonna be like a good data. If good data goes in, go good data uh, comes in, goes out. So of course, uh, I feel like this is where we're moving towards now, um, uh, like m m increasing the number of data. So studies that we have, like how many studies I have published with you know uh, not many non many participants that will you know, then it's not going to be the case. We're collected data in, oh, we performed five squats, and then we're averaging data there and trying to understand those five squats. So how many squats can I get, you know, for, for a week period? Mm -hmm. uh, how do they do squats when they're doing other things? Uh, right. So getting out of that environment. But of course, 
to get there, to understand that data, we need to, to validate, compare with a control data set, a control environment, mm -hmm. which is still in the lab. Uh, so I think we're moving towards that direction. There's still some, some work, homework to, to get there. Yeah, how about you, Kirsten? Yeah, I agree. I think uh, finding a way to uh, really get that, that hybrid solution between the, the IMU wearable sensor in the community that they can take home with them, that we can gather long-term information uh, that we can relate back to what we gather in the lab is, is key. Um, and I do think that we, we will get there. Um, I think, you know, one of the, one of the things you were asking about like a limitation with the current technology and like thinking back on that now, it, you know, uh, the, the sensors that we currently wear for wearable sensors in the community to wear home right now, like I want something that I can give to them that they can take home with them for, you know, an extended period of time that's not bulky and, uh, you know, some big big thing that they have to put on. I want something nice and slim that they can put on underneath a little nice strip, stick it on their leg and it's easy to wear. And that's what they need. So a sticker, yeah. slap the sticker on that they can put on their thigh and that they can, nobody's going to see it. That's what they need. If we can get them that um, and they can wear it for a week, then that's, that's ideal. I think we're getting there. I think we are 10 years within 10 years. And then within 15 years, I'll be retired. And then, <laughs> then it's someone else's problem. Then it's somebody else's problem. <laughs> yeah, so um, that's really interesting. Um, is there anything from like us as industry or technologies that could help further enhance your biomechanics skills, you know, uh, uh, like in terms of data collection? Is there anything that you would love to see to be able to like improve that in terms of like? you know, quickness of data collection processing or are you fairly happy with where things currently are within motion capture, for example? Well, like I said, if we can get a sticker that they can stick on their thigh and wear out in the field. I mean, even think about on the soccer field, do you want to gather like full body, full lower extremity kinematics and kinetic, like full body kinematics with an IME system. I want something slim and thin that they can put on um, out on the field. Um, it's unintrusive that the, um, the referee is not going to give us a hard time about that, you know, um, that would be great. Or even markerless, yeah. like I mean, uh, or you know, markerless yeah. out on the field. So you go to a soccer field, you put some cameras out, you cross them together, you are collecting twenty two players playing yep. at the same time. You know, if that's reliable data, that's that's unique. That's the whole pitch, awesome. though. The whole I want the whole pitch, though. I want the whole. I want both teams. I want yeah. the whole t the whole pitch. Yep, and the referees. Yep, yep. Yeah, that would be so. that would be amazing. But, so you would say you, it's more a case of being able to expand that functionality outside of the lab as opposed to what technology is currently happening within the lab. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like how, how much time we lose like placing markers on a participant? We have like, I don't know, 50 markers to place on. You know, you got to be trained. You got to go there, palpate, put the marker in the right spot. Uh, of course, that takes time, you know. Uh, everything that you could, you know, uh, fast forward processes uh, and, and getting good data out, that's, that's a win. Yeah, no, that's really interesting and uh, good points. Final question, because in case any of the participants ask, um, are you, um, how are listeners uh, able to reach out to you both? If they want to have more information, are you willing to share your email addresses to the group? Um, if you are, if you could just place it in the chat, so then everyone can see that. So that if anyone has any questions, feel free to reach out. I'm also seeing questions coming in now. So the questions are open up to the uh, to the group. So we do have one in the chat. Uh, Kirsten, I don't know if you did respond. Um, it's hi, my name is uh, John Sun, uh, an assistant professor. I'm creating a biomechanics lab at Odia State University. Apologies if I pronounced that wrong. Totally understand that the procedure protocol should be documented. I have a question about marker sets. For example, the lower body motion capture, can you share what marker set you use, plug and gate, cluster set, CGM2? 
I used to use Plugin Gate and try to use CGM2 and want to hear about your experiences, the mocks that you have used. Yeah, well, that's a loaded question. So my response is that it 100% depends on your application, really. I mean, if I'm doing, you know, gait analysis, uh, like a clinical gait analysis in a cerebral palsy patient, and it's a very straightforward, like just lower extremity gait, I might be comfortable with doing, you know, either the plug-in gait or the CGM2, uh, CGM like, marker set, like a very standard lower extremity set. But if I'm going to go with like a sports medicine application and I want to do this in like an ACL, like post-op kid, then I'm going to go with a cluster analysis of the six degree of freedom model. So, you know, it really, really depends on what my application is and what my patient population and what my question is. Um, if I'm going to look at a kid that has a uh, club foot and a 15 or 16 year old, I'm probably doing a marker set that has a multi-segment foot model. So, you know, there I'm going to be changing it and doing it with a little bit different, right? Like, so it, it really depends on the question and who your, what, what your question is and what your, uh, your kind of variables of interest are, I would say. I mean, Dan, would, would you agree? It kind of, yeah. Of yeah. Right. Um, the next one is an IMU one, uh, which Dan, uh, if you can answer, are there any resources that you'd recommend to learn how to use and process data from IMUs? Well, there's a bunch out there. And, um, and again, depends uh, what you want to get out of the IMUs. Uh, so we explored a little bit, uh, a bit more than a year ago, uh, getting, getting kinematics out of I'm used to playing with the quaternions and, and trying to correct the, the drift um, just to get reliable data for, for a bit longer data collection. Uh, and that went so-so. <laughs> so there's, there's a lot, although there's a lot of research going on, like right now, trying to, to fix those issues, you know. Uh, so there's some systems that they provide a little bit more of kinematics. The other, there, there are others that provide a little bit more, uh, more of uh, other variables of interest. So it depends what you want out of the, the IMUs. Uh, perhaps like if I, we, we want to collect kinematics, out of five consecutive days for a full day long, going with kinematic data, uh, that'll be just too much, you know, like for the, for the drift correction, especially, that would be a super, super challenge. Um, so that's why we opt uh, to get an, another system that provides us a, a different types of uh, variables. So it all depends what you want, what do you want to collect? Kirsten, is there anything to add to that? No, not really. I agree completely with what he said. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, at the same, if, I mean, like you said, there's many different, um, protocols available, open libraries in MATLAB and also Python, but ultimately it comes down to your question. Um, if you want to, I guess, learn more about what other researchers senses, the journal is really good to look at different people's methodology. So maybe worth checking that out as well. Next question, uh, do you use visual feedback with the cameras to rehabilitate patients? If so, which software? We don't use it for rehab. Um, um, we, have, we don't use it for rehab. We've used a little bit of like real time, like um, reaction time things. Uh, um, where we've done some real time stuff with that, um, but where we've done like um, either MATLAB or, or LabVIEW, where we've pulled in a live feed of the data into LabVIEW to do a reaction time, like go this way, cut that way kind of thing, but we've never done anything in terms of rehab. Yeah, neither us. Uh, we don't do much of rehab. Um, so giving feedback, um, it's just like if the position is not right, not exactly as we went in the protocol, for example, then seeing through an axis, we can see, uh, you know, the position is not right or not quite what we want. So it's either the participant or our placement that has an issue there. Um, so the, the pure using axis could give us uh, some idea of uh, what's going on, uh, but not for rehab specifically. So like instructing, nah, that's not something that we do, unfortunately. Do you think possibly like say, for example, if technology progresses more in a real time element with like IMUs, markless even, 
optical, you, you feel like you'd actually bring more of that real-time rehabilitation or data collection into, into it? I think so. Uh, I think like it will be a combination of both, right? The, the, if you're talking about rehab, so you're talking about like a physio being in on site uh, and, and seeing with, uh, you know, uh, their own eyes, what's, what's going with, uh, with the movement and trying to, you know, measure uh, what's, what's happening on that specific situation. Um, but I, I feel like the, the, I, don't, I wouldn't. I wouldn't know how to point like with specific software to look into to because that's not something that I do. Yeah, I get ultimately like Kirsten and Dan have said throughout. It's very much a case of what you're trying to uh, review in real time. There's many different softwares out that that can allow that. It's Motec, Motion Monitor in terms of doing real time that connects into Nexus. You can also use MATLAB to an extent, Python, LabVIEW. Um, yeah, these, and then even within an optical environment, for example, within Nexus, you could create a monitor and use like real time feedback within there and create that feedback. So I guess ultimately it depends on what you're trying to do um, with that. Uh, but if you wanna know more about how you could do that within Nexus, please uh, do email us at either my name at bicon.com or support at bicon.com. I'll put that in the chat so people uh, can see that. Um, we don't have any more questions. So I'd just like to say thank you to you both for um, participating. It's been, I could literally talk about some of these subjects uh, for so much longer, but we've all got to continue and GC Mass is carrying on. So everyone that's going to be at GC Mass, hopefully, um, we can have that conversation. But if you do want to chat to us privately, we do have a breakout room at Vicon, which Alicia has just posted now, which we will be moving to that room. So if you do any of your questions with me, uh, feel free to reach out there. Um, I'm going to end that uh, end that here. So thank you so much, uh, Dan and Kirsten. It's been great. And hopefully next time we can do this in person. Yeah. Uh, so enjoy the rest of CMAS, uh, GCMAS, and I'll uh, see you all soon.